It's my pleasure to kick off the discussions for the evening with an introduction of the panel titled Go Public or Stay Private. Um, I would first like to introduce to my left uh, Professor Edward Walter. Ed is the, uh, is the Steer Center uh, Chair in Real Estate. Currently, uh, his day job, however, is running the largest hospitality REIT in the United States of America, host hotels and resorts. Ed uh, is on our faculty, as I said, and he teaches the, uh, the REIT course for us. Um, and he's a graduate of the law school here, the Georgetown Law School. To his left, we have Lamotte DuPont, co-founder of the DuPont Fabros uh, Technology, as well as chairman of the board of directors. His company is a REIT and a leading owner, developer, operator, and manager of wholesale data centers. And he is a graduate of Georgetown from the MBA program here. To his left, we have Terry Brown. Terry is the chairman and CEO of Edens, which is a leading retail real estate owner, operator, developer in the US. He's been in the position since uh, joining the company in 2002. And finally, Mike Graziano, co-head of the real estate department at Goldman Sachs, where he has been literally since the day he left campus back in 1988. Uh, he's, an under, he's a graduate of the Georgetown McDonough undergraduate program. So truly a pleasure to have you all here. With that, Professor Walter, it's all yours, my friend. Thank you. Thank Professor you, Matt. Walter, that's impressive. Does this sound? I like the ring of that, actually. Um, why don't we start off with a quick description? We're going to obviously get into your companies in greater degree, but why don't you give people a sense of the scale of your enterprises and maybe a little bit more, especially in your case, a little bit more about what you actually, what your, what your business is. Sure. Start with me. Start with you, Mike. Well, we, uh, we design, build, operate, and own data centers, which are basically facilities that provide security, redundant power, cooling, and access to robust fiber to a variety of tenants that need to engage in computer processing, whether they're a search engine, whether they're a company like um, uh, Amazon.com or Facebook, whether they're a bank or a pharmaceutical company, we just provide that uh, safe, redundant environment where they'll bring in their servers, essentially plug them in, tap into fiber, and be able to engage in computer uh, processing. We're on the wholesale side of the market, which means we only deal with very, very large users of power. So Microsoft, Yahoo, Facebook are our largest tenants, uh, as opposed to the retail side, uh, where there's a smaller caged environment where a tenant may just have a couple of servers. Total scale of the company today is? Um, we're almost a $3 billion company. We do have an OP unit structure, so that confuses a lot of people when they, when they value the company. I hope not anybody in my REIT class. <laughs> so uh, we're growing rapidly. The demand for space that's adequate for computer processing is growing very, very rapidly. Um, and that does not include every couple of years. There's a new a tenant that comes out of a garage like a Facebook didn't exist 20 years ago. So there's plenty of demand drivers um, for this type of space, which is far outgrowing uh, um, supply right now at least. Good. We're going to come back to that in a minute. Terry, talk a little bit about your firm. Edens is a, a bit more tr traditional than Lamont's company. Uh, we are one of the largest private owners of neighborhood <laughs> shopping centers in the country. We've been an institutionally capitalized company since 1997. Uh, today, we're a $5 billion company. Um, our primary three, three, our three primary institutional investors are J.P. Morgan Strategic Property Fund, uh, a Blackstone-sponsored investment vehicle, and New York State Teachers. Uh, we own uh, neighborhood centers uh, really from New York uh, down through Florida. Uh, we have uh, recently closed, last month we bought a public company in Texas called Amory, so we've now expanded um, into Texas. We have a investment grade balance sheet. Uh, I think relative to the public peers, uh, we have one of the highest quality portfolios. And for those of you who live in DC, we're I think pretty well known for owning the city block around City Vista at 5th and K. Um, our Mosaic District um, mixed use development at the Dunloring Metro. And um, more recently, we're focused at Union Market, um, which is at the intersection of Florida and New York Avenue here. 
all very interesting projects. Mike, give a sense of the scope of your activities. Uh, sure. As Matt said, first of all, I am a, a grad, 84 to 88 here at, uh, at Georgetown. Um, the business school undergraduate. I'm amazed at how, every time I come back, I'm amazed at what's happened to the school in terms of how much uh, it's grown and how different my experience was. And I'm sure a lot of people in the audience, there was no, just thinking today, there's no internet, uh, no cell phones, and the drinking age, the legal drinking age was 18. So make of that what, what you will. Um, and I guarantee you, if I applied now, there's no way I would get in. So for those that have gotten in, good job. Um, so I, uh, as, as Ed touched on, I was Massachusetts, I co-head the Global Real Estate Inve Investment Banking Business at Goldman Sachs. I uh, also, as Matt touched on, I joined Goldman Sachs in 1988 as an analyst directly out of Georgetown um, and uh, left promising never to return uh, after my two years as an analyst because I had just learned so much, but I figured for sure there were other things out there. I went to business school at another institution, which I won't mention, um, and, uh, and, and, and came back realizing that I, that I, was, I was where I belonged to, to, to begin with. And so our business is basically that of uh, corporate advisory, general investment bank services, M&A advice, capital raising advice, um, everywhere from straight equity to, to straight debt, and everything in between, as well as principling mortgage finance uh, on a direct basis with clients. It's a global business, um, and which is why I'm glad to have a co-head. And so we have people on the ground in Asia, in Beijing, Singapore, Hong Kong, Shanghai, uh, London, as well as the Middle East and Brazil and Australia and Japan and a couple other places I'm sure I'm, I'm, I'm forgetting. So what you just summarized was your usual monthly trips. Uh, yeah, exactly. And these guys are all clients, so you'll find that I generally agree with everything they say, and I will um, I'll try not to suck up too much and give you some <laughs> Which is why he's so good at what he does. <laughs> I take that as a compliment. It was. It was, certainly, it, it was certainly intended to be. You know how highly I think of you. <clears throat> Terry, the roots of the company were in traditional strip center product, but with the example of Mosaic and really what you were describing to me before was going to happen up at the, the market project too, it looks like you've moved more into mixed use. As you look at those two segments of the business, are the supply demand fundamentals any different between the two? Do you find one more attractive than the other right now? Well, I think as it relates to the traditional neighborhood business, um, I think actually in that business the the existing inventory has never been more valuable, and I think the supply uh, demand fundamentals are just extraordinary. I mean, if you think about it, over the last 30 years in the traditional business, the average new deliveries as a percentage of inventory in the States was about 2%, so roughly tracking, let's call it GDP, which makes sense. Um, today, really over the last few years, there was really no new development, but in the last few years, and it appears in the next few years, uh, you really are talking about you know, 50 basis points to less than 100 basis points of existing, so existing um, inventory. So what we own, I think, in the traditional product is really much more valuable. The issue, you could say, well, why, if it, with that kind of um, constraint, why isn't there more development? But I think the reality of it in our business, most of that traditional product is grocery anchored. Um, and people get caught up in you know, the Whole Foods, Fresh Market, um, Trader Joe's. But the reality of it is each one of those, you know, um, new and interesting kind of grocers opened up 30 to 40 stores last year in the entire country or even internationally. The traditional grocers like Kroger, Safeway, and the others really were net negative in new stores. So there are no new anchors for new development in the traditional business, which leads add to kind of the answer to your question. So the retailers, retailer sales also are pretty, pretty tepid. I mean, retailer sales are recovering. They're not, they're still uneven. Um, and so the retailers are very selective about where they're going. Most of that activity and their interest is urban. Well, the reality of it is you can't do traditional product in urban because the land prices, um, multifamily developers can pay a lot more than retail. So you're left with mixed use. And I think um, you know, mixed use has its own issues, but we've been very fortunate to find great opportunities. It's very profitable, it's, I think the risk profile is a little different, but I, I think that mixed use product is where the retailers want to go. So that's driving the demand. Well, that makes sense. Lamont, give us a sense of how, sort of how fast demand is growing in your world and maybe match that up a little bit with what you're seeing on the supply side. Sure, uh, it's growing very rapidly. Uh, 20 years ago, the sector didn't exist. Obviously, we're tied very closely to the internet and the advent of the internet and what comes out of the internet. Um, there's something called Moore's Law, 
which essentially means that every 18 months, roughly, uh, chips uh, generally will double their capacity of processing uh, by using only just a little bit more power. So I often get the question, well, how can you outstrip that? But demand is far outstripping uh, Moore's law. Uh, it's very strong. Supply has come about uh, recently uh, and very heavily. Uh, we were the second company of this sort to go public uh, in 1997 on Black Friday, uh, <laughs> right before the 2008 <laughs> crash. Uh, but since then, there's been a variety of companies that have come out all across the spectrum from retail to wholesale. Private equity has gotten involved. Uh, the returns are terrific just because demand is so, so great. In terms of supply, um, it's easy to buy a piece of land, site plan it, hire a construction company, build the asset. The real value in the company is the people who are pushing the buttons. Uh, our typical facility has about 36 megawatts of critical load. That's load that goes directly into the servers. So the mechanical and the electrical engineers that are fiddling with that power and making sure that it's clean and accessible uh, are really the heart and soul of the company. So there are high barriers to entry. However, uh, supply has come about quite a bit. And from a standpoint of what matters most to your tenant, mm -hmm. it's a combination of that skill and I assume backup power has got to be a key part of that too. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> excuse me, in some sense, these are the crown jewels that are in these data center facilities. My daughter is on Facebook all the time and it never goes down. Banks can never go down. Other com uh, uh, functions, it's very important that they never go down, so there are layers of redundancy within the facility, up to the point where uh, if we're operating off the grid for more than a couple of weeks, there's a much larger problem in the world. So it is very redundant, it's very secure. Um, access to the facilities, different tenants have different profiles about their security. Um, Mike, another way to look at industry fundamentals that probably matters to all three of us up here is uh, the price of capital. Uh, clearly, capital is available today in, in virtually every area. Um, how, do you, how do you see, as you look out the next 12 to 24 months, is it going to get any, is it going to get any better, any cheaper, or have we, so are we starting to hit the top here? It is hard to imagine that it gets, you know, a lot better than where it is right now. I mean, it is, it's a pretty amazing moment in time on both the equity side, the debt side, and everything, everything in between. Um, you know, it, it's hard to envision a scenario where interest rates get that, that much lower or where there's the, 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 the price of debt financing in the real estate space gets lower. Hard to envision uh, multiples for public read stocks getting dramatically higher. Other than, I know you, you guys are dramatically undervalued, all the public. You see how this works? I'm, uh, uh, <laughs> so, but having said that, I think everybody looks and feels like they're pretty, uh, at least somewhat fairly valued, if not you know, fully valued in the marketplace today. So what does all that mean if it's not going to get much better? I, I, don't, I don't have a uh, doomsday view of what's going to happen because I think that even if interest rates do go up, by definition, that can't possibly be good for uh, read pricing or for asset level pricing, but it's also probably not a death nail because as Terry touched on, we are, the capital markets have been well ahead of actually the underlying fundamentals that we've seen in the real estate space. And that's because as it, there is a little bit of a different analysis between underlying real estate fundamentals and where people want to put capital to work. And so REITs have been a great solution or a great provider for folks that are looking for uh, certainty, predictability, cash flow, yield, all the things that the, the investing public has been very, very attracted to. So money has flown in and read prices have moved up, helped by low cost of capital on the debt side. Um, but I would not say, I don't think most people would say that the underlying fundamentals of the businesses where retailers have gone, occupancies and rents and office, but whatever, whatever asset class you're looking at, we're still, you know, no one's suggesting, I haven't heard people suggest that we're in, you know, the seventh, eighth, ninth inning of that type of recovery. So as that the very things that will cause some of that capital cost to change or interest rates to go up will also cause, cause the underlying fundamentals at the real estate properties to get better. So NOIs, EBITDAs, FFO, whatever measure you want to use will likely rise. Maybe multiples will come down a little bit, but you know, where that battle, who wins that battle and what that means for pricing over time is very unclear. I don't think it's, 
uh, I don't worry too much about it, let's put it that way. No, I, would, I would agree with you. If you look at the lodging business right now, you'd say that you'd see that demand over long periods of time grows around 2% in the U.S. Now, the last six or seven years, including the downturn, it's actually grown faster than that. But supply in our world is still in the one and a quarter to 1.3% range. So when you come back to core fundamentals, there's still a lot more demand growth than there is supply growth, which bodes well for that. I suspect, though, that given what we saw in 07 and what we saw in the 80s, it wouldn't surprise me if lending, I'm not certain lending pricing gets better, but I think leverage levels are going to continue to grow. Oh, yeah, that's it. Because uh, there's always that temptation, yeah. and I can't believe this time it's different. Yep. Cycles will exist. <laughs> they're, they're not going away. But the one thing yet, though, is like U.S. real estate assets, I think you can make, if you pick up today's Wall Street or New York Times and you see North Korea going to have a nuclear arsenal, you have beheadings in Ethiopia, you have all this you know, really negative interest rates in Europe for bonds. You know, the U.S. is still just an extraordinarily safe place. People want hard assets. I think that, Mike's talking about capital and the cost of debt, but in a really uncertain world where capital's got such geopolitical risk, the United States is, just, is still just a safe haven. And even then, you want to touch hard assets. I think that's a real factor. No, I think that's why our interest rates have stayed as low as they have, because they don't really belong at this level, but the market's keeping them down for exactly that reason. Mike, touch on the IPO market a bit. How do you see that in 15, and maybe even in the beginning of 16? Yeah, it, it's, that's pretty straightforward. The, the IPO market, I mean, I think is, could be wide open, meaning there is a lot of capital out there chasing uh, strong you know, investment opportunities. The, the real trick isn't the, is the IPO market open as the capital. The real trick is, is trying to find companies that should be public and that, you know, sort of fit all the measures that the investing public is looking for. The real estate space is, is pretty incredible. I mentioned starting in 1988, the real securitization of the real estate space, if you can call it that, uh, of, of, of these companies really starting to become more into public format out of, out of private format was, you know, sometime in the early 90s. And you look at where the space has come and you have some really well-regarded, well-capitalized, sizable uh, real estate businesses in each of the different silos, storage, apartments, uh, shopping centers, malls, uh, lodging, gaming. And so there are some very well-seasoned companies uh, with great track records. So to get public, you have to provide the investing public an alternative to what they already have, because they already have six, seven, eight great ways to put money to work in, in the office sector or in the mall sector or in the apartment sector. Um, and there just aren't that many companies that are out there that have the size, scale, scope, um, and expertise and track record to sort of get over that hurdle. Um, and it's really more about that, um, unfortunately, because I wish there were a lot more. It'd be great for our business. And it, it ebbs and flows. It's very hard to predict. So two years ago, there were eight large, huge IPOs. Uh, we were fortunate enough to be lead left book runner on seven of them, which is even better, by the way. Um, but I don't see that happening. You're not going to see, uh, you'll see, uh, you know, some here, some there. But uh, it's more about trying to find the, the enterprises that really want to be public. I'm sort of surprised you missed one on that, but it probably was some sort of a conflict. Terry, you're the perfect example of, uh, of a company that could go public. As you guys have thought about that, there, there obviously are some advantages to remaining private. How have you, what has guided you in some ways to remaining a private company in this world? Well, I think um, the ability to be a large private company of scale has been critically important. Um, First of all, the public companies now are such, so much more improved just in terms of the benchmarking of people, the work they do, the reporting, the things we get to see as a private company. It actually, I think, has driven our company to perform better, sets higher standards and benchmarks. In our particular case, we've been fortunate. We've had really strong long-term institutional equity ownership. Um, as an unrated, unsecured borrower, we've been able to consistently over the last decade access the institutional marketplace on a basis that's very competitive from a cost of debt point of view. Um, and I think in our, in our specific case, our investors like the asset. Uh, we own 117 shopping centers. Um, I mentioned we've been an institutionally owned company for 18 years. One of the shopping centers of the 117 that we own today, we owned originally. So our asset changes all the time. So our investors haven't been inclined to change. 
Uh, I think the other thing, um, you know, the mall space has largely now been dominated by the public companies. I think our investors seemed determined to keep ownership of neighborhood, some neighborhood space privately. Um, they like the control they have over us, the transparency around it, and it's been a really remarkable investment. So I, I think at various points in time, we, we run the company as an IPO type ready company. I think the management team would have loved to have been a public company over time. Um, but I think our investors seem very comfortable um, being a large scale private company. Lamont, you mm -hmm. guys went public relatively early in your history, we right? Did. Mm -hmm. If you were, I guess, talk a little bit about the difference between public market valuations and private market, market valuations in your world. Well, as a private company, we were growing very rapidly in a, in, in a sector that was growing very quickly. The facilities themselves are extremely expensive to build. A typical facility, uh, 300 plus million dollars, and it's not the land, the shell necessarily, it's the tenant improvements that go inside, the generators, et cetera, et cetera, which in our business model, we own all of that. So we didn't have so much flexibility in terms of choosing to go public or not choosing to go public. Um, 2008 was looming. Um, we decided to pull that trigger. We needed to do that to grow and to keep, you know, to expand. Uh, certainly believe it was the right decision um, in access to the public markets, bonds, perpetual preferred. We always have the ability to issue additional equity. Uh, gives us many choices in uh, financing our growth. When you look at, is most of your growth generated by development or are you also buying other centers? No, we're strictly a pure play in the sense that we do A to Z, we design it all the way to operating it. And we own what's Im important is not only the land and shell, but also the, the real guts of the building, which is not the case with uh, many of our competitors. So we're perfectly aligned with our tenants. Uh, we have few assets and few tenants, meaning several dozen as opposed to hundreds, uh, and a few buildings, meaning less than 15. The whole company is the whole 15. Company. Yeah. So as you, right now you're in four major markets, as I remember. Um, is there, is there a nut, what, what are the four again? I know one's here. Uh, well, Ashburn, uh, which is basically the Dulles International Airport area, is our main campus um, for good reasons. Uh, after Silicon Valley, it's the most fiber-rich soil in the country. Uh, we have a large presence in Chicago. Uh, Silicon Valley, of course, if we're in this business, we need to be out there and then uh, New Jersey, which primarily serves the off-site New York trading and other functions. Uh, we are looking at other markets in the country carefully. We're also looking carefully at going overseas. However, that presents a whole series of challenges. Um, there's tax leakage, there's other leakages, employment laws. Uh, if we did something like that, it would most likely be by some sort of an acquisition as opposed to starting off from scratch. Yeah, how much longer did you want us to go? Okay. Um, well, I just, I don't want to fall behind on schedule. Um, Terry, everything looks pretty good right now. I think certainly if I'm, when I'm answering the question about um, my outlook for the hotel industry, it's pretty positive. Um, but at some point, every cycle has an end. And so we know this one will too. As you look at the, what are the indicators that you watch that would ultimately make you more cautious about moving forward with that next development transaction? Well, obviously we're in the retail, retailer business and our business is driven by serving and providing space to those retailers. So the risk in our business are largely economic. So we're driven by either population densities um, or household income. So it is, is a very easy, very simple uh, formula um, that drives our business. Uh, right now, as I mentioned, the supply demand fundamentals are extraordinary. Um, things are very under control. I think the big risk that, as I mentioned, that I am concerned about as it relates to this cycle is that there's a geopolitical risk that impacts the economy in the U.S. Yeah, I think you're right. It's that uh, almost all sectors right now, it looks like the supply side is reasonable. The issue is just does something interrupt the it's demand? It's the things we don't know. It's right. the unknown and things we can't control that in my mind are the biggest risk today. 
Lamont, if you looked at, you talked about um, raising <coughs> capital in advance of the prior downturn. Um, when you look at what actually happened on the operating side, sort of your know, NOI in that downturn, mm -hmm. was there much of an impact to your world? Because no. I mean, the in terms of downturn, right? The economy? No, because the, the drivers for, for demand in our particular industry are not necessarily related to the overall economy in the sense that uh, will people continue to use the internet? Are people in a compromised economy using less of the search function, for example? Now, they may be purchasing less on Amazon, but that doesn't directly filter down into our business. So based on the demand drivers that we have, and I mentioned Facebook, for example, before, is not necessarily affected in a meaningful way by the overall economy. Other tenants, you know, such as Match.com or these high press, you know, they don't, they're not necessarily directly affected by a downturn. Good. So we're less, uh, less impacted. Good. Gentlemen, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.